Scott Woods from rockcritics.com. It's December 21st, 2009. Talking once again to Bob Dobbs. This is our sixth chat together. Bob Dobbs, making the world safe for rock criticism. Yep. And uh, talk to me about December 21st, Bob. You were saying a little something before we uh, came on air. What, what's, what's the significance of December 21? Well, Zappa was born on December 21st, 1940. And it's the legendary date for the Mayan calendar singularity, December 21st, 2012. So it's interesting. It uh, coincides with Zappa's birthday. And, and uh, didn't uh, we just recently, um, didn't the calendar just recently go past Zappa's, uh, the date of his death as well? Yeah, December. Not recently? Yeah, December 4th. Ah, okay. And that would be 16 years ago, 1993. Right, okay. Huh. So he was born in 1940. He would have been in his uh, sort of mid 20s when he started coming on the the rock scene. Well, like in a in a major sort of way with his first record and stuff. Yeah, that was uh, summer of fifty of sixty six. So he was twenty five, approaching twenty six. So he was in his twenty sixth year. Right. Okay. So he probably had a couple. Of, I'm just trying to put some pieces together here. He probably had a couple of. Uh, couple years ahead of Meltzer in, in terms of his age, but but they're roughly the same age anyways. Yeah, Meltzer's, I think, 43 or 40, 1943 or 1945, not, I think there's two conflicting dates. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Bob, um, I wanted to um, start this by, if you're cool with it, I wanted to play you back um, a little clip um, of you and Ben Watson from one of your recent shows. I just kind of wanted to, you guys had a couple interesting ideas that I wanted to um, kind of explore in there. It's about a two and a half minute segment, and then I wanted to just follow that up with um, something else and take it from there. Are you cool with that? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so give me one second here. So this is you and Ben Watson uh, chatting on your episode number 31, which happened about, I guess, a week and a half, two weeks ago, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Here you go. Always keeping up on what's going on, just like you do. You tune in to what's happening and take a fancy response to it. Well, one tries, but at the same time, I mean, one of the things that has always uh, uh, made me wince is watching a particular uh, rock critic. I don't know if you're aware of him, called Simon Frith. Oh, yeah, he's the main guy who knows the books in the big bookstores. I've seen his books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, he's a professor, isn't he? Yeah, he's a professor. And yeah. he's also... Um, he's a Grail Marcus. Yeah, he gets involved with the... Um, yeah, I mean, Grail Marcus, I, I disagree with Grail Marcus for all sorts of reasons. I think he's a, a literary fellow trapped in having to write about rock records. Um, I look at some but, of books. But, I, look, but, I look at them but, and I say, this is ridiculous. Like, I don't care to read them. Well, exactly, exactly. I mean, Grill Marcus can, well, that's what I was going on to say, Grill Marcus can actually write. Simon Frith can't write. He's, he's a, a sociologist and an academic, and he's kind of um, stilted. He, he, he can't name his books. He, he, he can't really string a sentence together, but he's got this position um, of, com of enthusiasm for pop music, which was authentic, I think, when he was a teenager in, in his early 20s. But he carries on saluting each new um, team fad, uh, each new team fad, each acceptable um, something that can fit an adult mindset just about and still appeal to the team. Whereas, if you understand the Frank Zappa, you know that the strength of rock music is not appealing to the adult mindset at all. It insults it. It, it it's not. Um, you the, the offensive part of the way that what offends your intelligence is its intelligence. That's what, what, what is different from your set of concepts. That's what stretches you, which is why Frank was always harking on about Louie Louie, this completely stupid song that's been the heart of what rock music is. And yeah. uh, Fritz doesn't understand that. He thinks um, uh, that he can somehow bridge the gap between the educated mind and, and rock music. And that's ridiculous. But he ends up this anti yeah. but, but he ends up um, um, always claiming that he's responding to the latest um, thing which the youth are enthusing with. And 
when I was younger, I always liked cantankerous old gits, you know, because I sensed something honest about them. Even if they were dissing me and completely disagreeing with all the things I loved, I knew that they were speaking from the heart, you know, that there was something real in them. I hope you heard that, Bob. Is that okay? Yes, and I was reading your transcript uh, that you typed out of that. Okay, good. But that was, um, I had to, like, hold the phone away from you. You could actually make that out, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, oddly enough, funnily enough, um, so, I, you know, I was thinking about that, and then I just, I literally opened a, a Simon Frith book I have about an hour ago, um, and on the very first page I looked at, I found a quote that kind of, completely contradicts some of that. So that, this is kind of what I want to explore a little bit. So I am taking up a lot of time here on the top, but you can, you know, go off forever after this. So That's all right. So here's, here's what um, Frith writes in the, I think it's the introduction to his book called Performing Rights, which I think came out maybe like 10 years ago or something. So he's talking about how different um, critics talk about sort of rock criticism and, and you know, what, what it's about. So he writes, take, for example, the following confident statements. Rock music, writes rightist cultural critic Alan Bloom in The Closing of the American Mind, quote, has one appeal only, a barbaric appeal to sexual desire. Not love, not eros, but sexual desire undeveloped and untutored. These are its three great lyrical themes, sex, hate, and a smarmy, hypocritical version of brotherly love. And then he quotes another critic. He says, The rock critic, writes leftist cultural critic Mark Crispin Miller in the New York Review of Books, struggles to interpret something that requires no, interpret no interpretation, tries to appraise and explicate a music whose artists and listeners are anti-intellectual and usually stoned, and whose producers want more than anything to own several cars. Then Frith writes, both writers seem remarkably assured that they know what rock means to its listeners and that the meaning of what they heard, I'm assuming, perhaps wrongly, that both men did listen to rock music before holding forth about it, was transparent. So he's, um, you know, that's definitely sort of a contradiction of what um, you and Ben were saying. And I guess the thing, I mean, I'm not, I don't really want to go into, you know, what Ben's personal feelings are on Simon Frith or anything like that. Um, although maybe that, that will be an interesting um, point to pursue as well. But more the idea um, first. I, I mean, you guys are kind of saying in that that rock is anti-thinking. But I guess the issue I kind of have with that or the question, let's put it that way, is how does that jive with the McLuhan idea, for instance, that the user is the content? Which I think is what Frith is kind of saying in his passage because he's saying, you know, you can't, you can't put this fixed sort of, you can't, like, claim to know what this stuff is, quote-unquote, about. Right. So I've got a, a great quote in response, which shows okay. the, the level that um, I come at this. Um, this is from Arthur Croker. Have you ever read him? No, but I'd like to, and you have, you have mentioned him, and, I, you know, I've read about him through some of your stuff. So, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, he's a professor now at Victoria University uh, in on Vancouver Island in British Columbia okay. now. Okay. Okay. But, but he was in the eighties and nineties at Concordia in Montreal. He was kind of he, he kind of gained some notoriety around that time, I think, right in the nineties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the BBC said that he was the Marsh McLuhan of the nineties. Okay. So yeah, he got a he got a popular reputation, uh, you know, well known and. Um, he did a book called Spasm, and the subtitle is Virtual Reality, Android Music, and Electric Flesh. came out in about 93. All right. So on page 54, I can't read it all, but I'm going to read a few sections. He has a section called Music Rules. And he says, like advertising, fashion, and cinema before it, music rules today as a dominant ideogram, note that, ideogram of power not a reflection of a serious materialist power which emanates elsewhere and that precedes it. The materialist power would be the Rockefellers, the Trilateral Commission, you know, the, the okay, wealth. Yeah. Not a reflection of that power. Music is a real ruling laboratory of the age of sacrificial power. Another way he would say it's not use value or exchange value, it is abuse value. That's the economy. Okay. And music is part of that. 
uh, I should say, in another part of uh, his writing, he says music is the coherency in the global hologram. It creates the coherent sense of coherency. So he'll, with that general idea, here's some details. He says, we are living today in the triumphant but desperate era of a set-aside re-commodification. Not commodification, re-commodification, which is like my idea of the holopathic retrieval. The simulational age, and that's the previous age, the simulational age of designer subjectivities where the commodity form most of all needs to be aestheticized to ensure its endless circulation through the debris of all the seductive objects of consumer culture. So he's talking about the previous phase of commodification. The simulation age of designer subjectivities where the commodity form must of all, most of all needs to be aestheticized to ensure its endless circulation through the debris of all the seductive objects of consumer culture. Hear music as an empty force, excuse me, hear music as an empty force field through which all the fibrillated subjects pass, lends a momentary coherency to a system of objects that always threaten to collapse in the direction of entropy and burnout. No longer only a simulation, music is now the key code of the postmodern body as a war machine. Music then as a force field through which process, process subjects pass with its privileging of pure speed, of sound approaching the velocity of light, with its vectoring of random subjects across a keyboard of outward emotions, with its inscription of the codes of frenzy and desire onto the body without organs, and with its fatal promise of pure inertia when the sound switches off and all the dancing bodies collapse. It is how postmodern bodies speak to one another, how they collude, conspire, and seduce. Here, the internal rhythms and grammatical codes of the war machine are transcribed into auditory codes that can only be seen with the ears and heard with the eyes. See, there's your mixture of the synesthesia. Okay. Seen with okay. the ears and heard with the eyes. And then he ends saying, and so an interesting question arises. What is the relationship between the inertial grammatical codes of postmodern society as a war machine and the acoustical sounds of music? Now, he celebrates what he calls crash music. That's his term for music in the 90s. Crash music is not as much a, re a representation of particular phases of culture, but it is one of the real world... Sorry, I read that. Crash music is not as much a representation of particular phases of culture, but is one, a representation of the real world of political economy. Crash music exists as a culture smasher, a cultural cyclotron, my cyclotron in uh, my tiny note chart is a cyclotron, if you look at the top. It's uh, partly inspired by this phrase. A cultural cyclotron in the era of crash economy. Now just think of what's happened the last year for crash economy, but we've had boom right. and bust for 30 years. Which is to say that culture is not a reflex of a political economy. It's not a mirror of political economy. But that society is now a reflex of key shifts in music theory and practice. So he's giving great importance to music. Right. Society so music is leading almost. Is leading? Yeah. Yes, it's leading. It's not that music reflects the society. Society reflects music. Hmm. Music rules in the quantum age because sound moves faster than the speed of light, thus quickly eclipsing history. Study music theory then as a laboratory of big transformations in power and economy. These phases... They will all have their punk period, their sampler phase, their house music era, their heavy metal economy, their rap aesthetics for the commodified body. And in the end saying, how does music serve as a laboratory of sacrificial power? In three ways. First, by its cultural code, where music serves to energize the dead and inert social field, replacing the history of the social body with nostalgia for a, for a romantic invocation of the culture of sound. See, he realizes it's a tactile situation. It's not just about sound. Yeah, okay. It's an afterimage of the romantic invocation of sound. Second, by its method, by its method, where when the energy is turned on, music as a force field activates the social in ruins. That's my idea. Everything's disappeared. And then, when the energy switch is flipped off, the imminent catastrophe promised by postmodern culture finally occurs as the sound fades away into the disintegration of time. And the third factor, and finally, by its presence as a cynical sign. Remember that cynical smirking that one of the quotes had? Of, of brotherly love? Uh, right, yeah. yeah. And finally, by its presence as a cynical sign, 
where the representational phase of music exists only as a nostalgic sign of that which long ago ceased to be. And that what long ago ceased to be is the age of power with a real referent. In other words, nobody knows who's in power anymore. The uh, age, the old age of capital, under the sign... Oh, sorry, I read that, I read that wrong. So... Uh, where the representational phase of music exists only as a nostalgic sign of that which long ago ceased to be, that's the age of power with a real referent. It's a sign of capital under, under the sign of abuse value, and where if the real tactile, there, one of the few people using the word tactile, and where, because he was a good student of McLuhan, and where if the real tactile bodies of musicians disappear in this, into the simulational order of drum machines and samplers, is because we are... Because if that is happening, it is because we are living now in the era of abuse value, where music is interesting only when it is purely cynical, an empty sign of that which never was. Now that's that's a mouthful, and that's exact. That's exactly what how I look at music or what's happening. This is this is scientific talk as far as I'm concerned, and I don't use this vocabulary, you know, on the radio. But that's what I'm. I'm uh, moving towards the same themes. Uh, well, I'll tell you one final thing. When Croker heard Bob's Mediacology, he, uh, someone told me, he said, hmm, those guys are doing what we're doing. Hmm. So there is, and that was back in 92. So you see the opinionating that Frith and uh, who else does he quote in there? Uh, Mark Miller and... Right, yeah, Mark Miller and... Um, oh, uh, Alan Bloom. Alan Bloom. So he said, he said he, and he specifically, his, part of his point in that passage I read is he's, he's quoting, you know, who he calls a right, a right winger, yeah. sort of, and a left winger. Have you ever to seen? That, to, to show that he feels they both have it wrong. Yeah, have you ever seen Zappa's debate with Alan Bloom? No. Oh, yeah, you probably could Google it. Uh, he, he wrote arguments, you know, wrote out some essay or for some interview or something, he wrote out his arguments on various Bloom points. Okay. It's good to know that. So, yeah, uh, you got Bloom. Uh, Mark Miller, who I know, and Frith. I would include Ben. None of them are dealing with the situation like Croker is. You know what I mean? Croker's on a yeah, whole other yeah. level. And Croker is more important because he, he knows the importance of music. It's a simulational string theory of physical matter that can't be put into the old terms, but it is something that's holding society together. It's very important. Part okay. of, you know, and so... I don't get into, you know, value judgments. Like, like Ben's talking about the, the, uh, the energy and id of youth. And he thinks, uh, you know, rock appeals to that. It's, not, it's the uh, id of, of growing up. And, right, and I have a big, huge problem with that, but go on. <laughs> yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't meet the needs of all ages now, you know, by the 70s, are, are doing rock music. So you can't you can't say it's young and old. That, those categories and all, are yeah. and all ages are the audience too. That's right. Well, that's what I meant. I meant the audience, the consumers right, are right. all ages. But then I would take it further. Since it is our TV body and chip body, we are Android processors. We are extensions of the Android meme. And this is not a negative situation. This is trying to show how far we've gone. And any of the categories anybody uses from the sciences or humanities. Uh, or sociology, or or just from a religious point of view, are puny compared to where we're at, you know. And I, I would say that the reason you like reading rock criticism because it was talking about where you were living. It was the only guy addressing nominally the environment that you were formed by, and we were all formed by because music was electrified music was the hologram of coherency in a world that was not able to be seen in particular because of the quantum yeah. fluctuations. I have a quote here. Uh, let me just grab this. Uh, okay. one, one of my favorite quotes uh, of Croker, which uh, gives the bigger picture that um, uh, I was just referring to uh, about quantum fluctuations. Uh, here it is. He says, a, this is in 93, this is in the, the Spasm Book 2, page 53. So it's just before the section I read you, which was 54 to 56. He okay. says, we're in a, qu a culture of quantum fluctuations where you can only know that you have never seen what you thought you were looking at because you have never really heard what you were listening to. Now, that's, music operates within that situation. Say, say that again so you can never... 
you, uh, you know, that you, yeah. A cul- we live in a culture of quantum fluctuations. Yeah. Which is like basically you can't measure what's happening. Remember the last right. line he said: "Music, rock music, an empty sign of that which never was." So this fills in what he means by never was. Uh, you can only know, all you can know is that you have never seen what you thought you were looking at. You can't know what you thought you were looking at. And the reason, because you've never really heard what you were listening to. You see, there's no sound, there's no sight, it's tactile, which cannot be measured. And we live in this tactile massage. But very extreme, because it's the machines ma- massaging themselves. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you look at what rock's doing, or in a modern entertainment music, has a life of its own. I mean, I just heard about Lady Gaga, okay? Right. New right. Britney Spears, new Madonna, and it just goes back to Patsy Cline, as you see on my yeah. chart. This will not stop. And, and that's why the, the old-fashioned literate baby boomer, or even the Generation Xer, can't get a handle on what's going on unless they go, let's say, meta, meta, meta. But I don't mean meta going abstract. It's seeing all the environments that are involved. And that's why I say what I'm presenting here is the valuable way to look at rock and rock criticism. You lead somewhere. Croker is already at that lofty point of seeing what's going on and writing great prose. So is, is, is it getting, um, how would I say this, is, is, there, is the distance sort of increasing between... Um, People trying to, you know, read read a kind of read using a sort of literary bias, I guess, for rock, which which most rock critics are. They have a literary bias, and and where we're heading um, as as a, as as a universe, I guess. Yeah, um, they they are POB, print oriented bastards, which is natural. All baby boomers in the West are that. It's our genetic makeup, our media genetic. So we are though. Most baby boomers cannot keep up with what's really going on and appropriately define it. Croker was one who did. He studied McLuhan well, and then he studied Bojard, who was the uh, updater of McLuhan, and then Croker went past Bojard. And then I come in on another level. I don't want to say I'm past Croker, but I can include him and go in other areas that he can't go uh, because he is a professor, so he's limited to the role and specialty he has become known for. Uh, there's no limitations on me. Do you know that Zappa said through the evergreens, he said, Bob, you should have been a rock star. <laughs> he thought I should have gone in rock because of my temperament. But the thing is, I was in it for the long haul. I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to go into rock. It might have been fun for a while, but I wouldn't want to get trapped there. I wouldn't want to just stay in that position to, to be tuned in to what's coming. That's the role of the real critic. Uh, so uh, it's not a big regret that I didn't get into rock. Um, so the, the, but the point is, what I like is being able to talk about the present and challenge with the pattern recognition I'm offering, and that's real critique. And Croker, look at, you know, if anybody hears that quote, if they have never heard of Croker or don't know his language, they're going to say, well, that's, you know, incomprehensible. But it makes a lot yeah. of sense when you take time uh, to look at it. He says um, here, aesthetic strategies for digital manipulation in the age of Android Android processes and recombinant culture. Why not music in ruins, too, after he lays out everything else is in ruins, which is like he was saying the same time as me, everything's disappeared. Why not music in ruins, too? That, he would call that crash music. Now think what of, does that mean, crash music? I am still confused by that. He's going to define it. Here's what it is. Okay. A cynical sound so intense so much a spectral commodity that like a dying red star it implodes with all of the dark intensity of a force field of pure inertia and pure speed passing through all of those drifting cyber bodies that's the computer the chip body consumers crash music question mark that is music as a universal force field of sound that can be so seductive because of its fascinating logic of an always promised always promised imminent reversibility think of uh, McClellan's tetrad then he says, pure ecstasy slash pure catastrophe. Music then with no past, no determinate meaning. That's what Mark Miller was saying, right? But Mark, yep. Miller, Mark Miller doesn't go anywhere with it. He doesn't see... Well, no, Mark Miller wasn't saying that, I think. Frith, Frith was saying that music has no determinate meaning, and he was dissing those other guys for saying that it does. 
Right. But, okay, go on. But he, but he doesn't get into first phase. McLuhan understood that music, rock music was phatic, and then you get into the crash music level of Coker's time where it's manipian phatic. So just to say um, no meaning is very uh, puny. It's, that's too tiny. It's not enough detail. So music then with no past, no determinate meaning, but perfectly defining, perfectly energizing, and perfectly postmodern. He then says, crash music, therefore, for the body without organs. That's another way of saying there is another part of our bodies rather than the chemical body organs. So a body without organs would be your TV body or chip body as a consuming apparatus. So crash music is for the body without organs, for sex without secretions, for flared eyes of the body telematic, for smells without a rotting skin, for neon ears without skulls. You see, it's easy to read it when you understand that you're not limited to your chemical body anymore. And he's just dropping all the chemical body reference points. You see? Uh, okay, okay, yeah. And so, so I would... Thanks, yeah. See, that's the point. So when I reread one of these paragraphs I already read, you'll get it easier. No longer only a simulation. Music is now the key code of the postmodern body, that's the discarnate body, as a war machine. You're a war machine by participating in all this stuff. You're part, you're part of the propaganda of the culture because you're using all the media. You're part of it. It's even more accessible to you, shrunk in the digital, so that you can use all aspects and blog and communicate and, and engage in the war of information exchange, which is this ongoing battle. And music, then, as a force field through which processed subjects, that would be processed chemical bodies pass, with its privileging of pure speed of sound approaching the velocity of light, with its vectoring of random subjects, all these chemical bodies are listening uh, to the music in their cars as they are in traffic jams on their way into Toronto, with its vectoring of random subjects across a keyboard of outer emotions, with its inscription of the codes of frenzy and desire onto the body without organs. So it's onto the... It's a, the problem with Ben is he emphasizes too much chemical body issues, like politics and aesthetics and sex and id and all that. Other people put on cultural taste-making uh, value judgment. Well, there's no meaning in rock. You know, you get more... LaRouche goes into how meaningful classical music is. But you miss the thing is that the modern tactile music is not communicating just to the, tech, the chemical body. It's communicating to the chip body and the TV body with all the sensibilities that it has. And basically, what is that sensibility? It's a boombox. So we go to this quote. And I'm laying this stuff out now. It might be too much uh, in this context, but let's get it up because I'm always going to be referring back to this. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. Yeah, that's okay. I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna absorb like a quarter of it. This no, evening, but I can say that you're laying it out. That that's that's totally cool. Yeah, because you want to get back to basics. So I mean, I never got. To, <laughs> we've talked about McClone, but you didn't know that I'm working on a level uh, past McClone, <laughs> jumping off from Croker. So he says this was written in. In another book, The Possessed Individual, which came out in 91 or 92, he goes, what is the speed of music? At what point does music redshift to ultrasonic velocity, like all those spectral objects before it? Break the sound barrier, and then follow an immense curvature towards the point of an incredible sound density, where music can finally move at such violent speeds that it can no longer be heard, even by mutant membranes. The fatal, po the fatal point, that is, where music breaks beyond the speed of light, falling into a deep and immense silence. Why the compulsive drive to immense volumes of sound? And that's certainly the most general characteristic of the last 30 years, is larger volumes of sound, right? Yeah. Fluctuating with uh, uh, the vinyl movement or uh, dinky stuff. I mean, it fluctuates all over the place. But generally, it gets more... Uh, Immense. More and more and more. Yes. Why the compulsive drive to immense volumes of sound? Why a tech and then he answers, is it a technological fascination with bad infinity, with the necessity to challenge dead space? Or is it an implosion of sound to that point of intensity where silence finally begins? Boom cars as alternating scenes of violent silence, like the eye of a tropical hurricane. And mo uh, okay, I'll do that again. Boom cars is alternating scenes of violent silence, like the eye of a tropical hurricane, and alternating with mobile war strategies, which overwhelm the menace of dead air in all those lonely cars with noise as a pure force field. 
Consequently, boom cars in L.A. as the last and best of all the urban nomads. Sites of longitude and latitude, speed and slowness. He's quoting Deleuze and Guattari. Moments of passing intensity. Boom cars then as crash hiatus. Now, hiatus is a strange word, but it's actually the uh, one of the meanings for H-C-E in Finning its Wake. Uh, It's H-A-E-C-C-E-I-T-I-E-S. Okay, there's that. He's going to define it. Boom cars then as crash hikayates. In other words, event scenes for becoming the velocity of music. So you see the boom car phenomenon. You know, when did that start? Late 80s? Yeah. I mean, people, is that music? It's certainly not someone sitting in an orchestra listening to a, a jazz esthete or class. Right. You know, it's a totally... It's, phys- it's physical, that sound, actually, of the bass coming out of the cars. Yeah, it's a physical, what Zappa called in 68, bone conduction. You're trying to rub and, and, and uh, push your chemical body beyond the sound barrier. You, right. actually, you, see, go- you actually feel it in your stomach. Yeah, and, you are, and you're also communicating it to everybody outside a kind of a declaration of war on whatever you think society is or your neighborhood is. What, what was that famous um, opening scene in uh, Do It Right? Do the Right Thing? Do the Right Thing, about 1989. The guy walking through his neighborhood with the boombox going. I recall that right. was the opening scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, that's a, an immense increased volume of the little kid with the transistor radio in the 50s, you know? Yeah. And so where are we now? What, it's not even tactile music. It is people with their own websites blasting in movie inventories, magazine articles, uh, books, and movie clips, found, uh, found sound. It's a whole satellite environment that people project now. That's what they're into. But then how does that explain how it went from... Uh, it went from, you know, the transistor in the 50s and 60s to the big boom boxes in the 80s and 90s, and now it's all, I'm listening to my own thing in my own little white headphones. Yeah, I would say that Croker is describing the uh, flip point of sound and, and showing that it's actually communicating silence. It's communicating a refusal of the noises around you by making your expression louder. So sound dies. That's the last phase of music and sound. And then as the media shrinks and kids can make their own movies and music, all the things that uh, movies and TV shows and and articles and all the mixed forms of communication they create on their YouTubes or MySpaces or Facebook, you see that music up to 1990 was the hologram for all these other media that people were consuming in the global theater. So the only common denominator was, was the music. And the phases that Croker outlines are what it went through. But that all collapses by 2000, and this is where I came in after Croker, and it's post-Android meme, it's the after image. So people don't just express music, they express all the media environments that music was the uh, bloodline reflector mirror of from 60 to 90. You, right, okay. you, you get what I'm saying is that why just be a musician? Why not th- show your favorite movies, mix up quotes from that, or just uh, however you collage it visually? You can be all arts and sciences right there on your web page. So you're not limited to the ear. Right, okay. Now, the young, the young chemical body, um, as, we, as James was saying on cash, on cash flow last week, um, he went and visited a family, and they had, a I don't know, an eight-year-old or something. And he couldn't believe how the kid was totally plugged in constantly with his computer and what other gadgets he had. And when, they, when James went up to spend some time with him, the kid insisted they do some online gamings together. Right. So that kid has music as, as part of his environment, but it's not the whole thing. It's like a tactile wearing the whole history of media. So that right. we've actually moved beyond sound as, a, as an any environment, as a stimulus. So these kids, uh, how do you judge them? And probably, you see, the music they do have are are passing fancies, which it's always been since the 50s, but it's even more passing. Uh, You can't gauge what the kids are into um, because it changes so fast. 
for the teen market. But, but by the time they go to college, it is actually a little slower, and then you might have some icons, you know, like Annie DeFranco in the 90s or a feminist icon. You know, in college it slows down and the kids actually focus on one or two bands and then they get into arguments about who's more politically correct or not, right? Right. But, right, the, yeah. but the young kid, uh, you know, we sent you that, that, little ki- that little girl, 15 years right, old. Right, right, yeah. That, to me, shows the modern consumer. I mean, she was communicating more than music there. She was mirroring back attitude to psycho profiles that she thought was happening in the news or in her peer group. You know what I mean? There was a whole bunch of... Uh, she was actually miming what Croker was saying because she ends by saying poop. You know? She cancels what she just expressed. Yeah. So, so that... What kind of ear is that? It's not... And, and she's not making a band. She's just having the camera forward, you know, tape her. Yeah, yeah. So it's the raw, it's like basic, ex- to just express yourself, to just, you know, attempt to communicate and include all the media that ever came, all the, all the musics, plural, all the pictures, all the uh, speedy movements, all the surfing you did, all that goes into uh, YouTube. And that is the comprehensiveness of what we have given to every kid today. So music, and that's why, you know, if I talk to Dave Neufeld, he tells me that you can't really figure out where the niche markets are, because there's so many of them. And so there's no centralized uh, source of music like there was in the baby boomer phase. You know what I mean? There was was no centralized AM radio, and then there there became a centralized FM, and then it all disappeared. Now... I don't know what it is, what you call it. Everybody c- tries to cross over into all the markets and usually fails and remains in one zone. And people who consume other kinds of music and other, other lifestyle profiles don't even know about, like broken social scenes, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. interesting. That happened a lot on the Internet at first with the, uh, the rock critic sort of blogosphere. Um, it kind of like blew up for a time in the early part of the decade, and it seemed like... It was kind of going in a whole bunch of different directions, and there was a whole a lot of different sort of conversations and, you know, this and that happening. And then it just at some point, it kind of like, it sort of got a little bit like everyone kind of reverted into their own corner of the universe. <laughs> is this in the mid, this decade you're talking about? Yeah, this is in this decade. Like, it, like, like I'm, you know, I'm bringing it back to rock criticism. There was definitely sort of a period around 2000, like, you know, 2001 to 2003 or 2004 when rock criticism was suddenly like kind of a big deal again, like at least within that world, because I mean, you know, it's always a constant stuff going on, but when it sort of, when the blog sort of thing took off, there was like just really like loud and sometimes exciting and sometimes ridiculous, whatever arguments going on all the time, like a lot of just, just inner conversation and blah, blah, blah. And it seemed like it seemed like something was kind of exploding in the whole thing, and it's and it did. You know, if you're a part of that world, it seemed like, hey, this is exciting. It's it's exciting to be you know part of this, even just you know if you're an observer, you're a participant kind of thing, and it's fun, to, and you can go in and comment on all this stuff. But then it's some. I don't know what it was that happened, but sometime around middle of the decade, and I've actually asked a bunch of other critics if they agree with me on this, and they they mostly do, that. It, something kind of dried up in, in that world, like around 2005, 2006, and now it's still, you know, there's still activity going on, but it's really this, I, I just, I keep thinking now there's like, you know, a blogger in the corner talk, chatting with his few friends, and then, you know, one of those friends might have their own blog, and it's, it's, it's kind of like just different um, circles of people, but it's not, it didn't, it didn't, nothing broke out in the end. Yeah, I, I would see that I mean, I say it's the post-Android meme phase from 2000 and on, but people love the new expression potential of having your own space and not being policed and not being controlled by your editor, and he's saying whatever you want about what you want. So everybody joined in in what Croker would call the supernova of expression. Everybody uh, got to express their favorites, whatever they were into, in all different ways. And, yeah. you, and you can look back and see... The uh, what McLuhan would call the arch- archetypes of the postures of mind. Because so much was happening in three or four years, you have moved through, if you were what, monitoring a lot of it, you have moved through every possible posture a mind could take in response to consuming music. And 
In other words, instead of taking 200 years to understand all the postures that mind could take from 1700 to 1950, which is what Joyce had the opportunity to do because it was slower in the literate society. But when you move through stuff, and they're, they're like seeing points of view, grabbing it, and then going to another one. So they see all the dynamics of interplay of postures you can have, and that eventually wipes out to silence because you've gone through a thousand years of in involvement and interesting ways a mind could look at music, and you've done it in three years because of the rapidity of information. And so you have burnout, the very thing that uh, uh, Croker is talking about. You have the burnout of personal expression. Then where are you at? And that's the crisis in, in all fields. We could say, when Croker says music is the ground for the shifts that society imitates, well, you could even say that rock criticism is part of that ground. And it burnt out, miming, what was coming in society, which was the burnt out of communication over the last few years. You, you could... The burnout, the burnout of communication is what happened in Wall Street. Nobody trusts anybody else now. They're all retreating their little bank, and uh, it's tough to even keep that going. So you see how raw criticism anticipated, and this is the kind of sentence I would come up with, the fate of the blogosphere for raw criticism anticipated the, cr the crash of the economy. And that fits in with what Croker said. Society, music, and its, and its communicational uh, genres are the ground of society. Okay, but sorry, so, okay, so, but what, what was the cause of, if, if we want to call it a crash, what, like, I'm, so I'm saying there was this, you know, sort of period that seemed like a kind of blooming of something new and interesting, and then, I mean, I wouldn't exact totally, well, yeah, it was kind of a crash, it was a bit of an intellectual crash in that the conversation suddenly seemed more, um, you know, people more just attuned to people with the same sensibilities as them and not as much um, reaching out to the world or something. So, so what, but what was the cause of that? Like, I like the point about how it, 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 uh, it, it precedes the uh, economic crash, but, but what's the cause in regards to the blogosphere, the communication? Yeah, it's, uh, it's fitting as Wake's quote, uh, gray at three. Joyce predicted that the young kids would be grade three because they're taking so much information and learning so much so rapidly compared to 100, 200 years ago. So, okay, now that's learning literate signs and acoustic right. signs. I mean, people learn differently as a tribe in the Amazon. They learn a lot, but they're learning differently. We're less, we're le the information age is the learning of fragments of sight and sound right. and, and movement. But... Um, uh, so the thing is, is that you learn a lot when you read these rock critics for three years. You learn of all the strategies, but you're eventually going to have a sense you've seen it all. So boredom is going to be the inevitable result, the tetradic flip point. And, and Croker wrote in his more recent book, you know, seven or eight years after spasm, that we had now moved into a boredom culture. And that's what it is. It's been for eight years. I mean, even the presidential image of Bush was a, a, a bored guy who couldn't even bother saying anything properly. Couldn't even right. bother responding to Katrina. <laughs> but he's right. bored. So that kind of... Uh, you call that post-information? Post or Post-information post society, yeah. And Is it post-communication as well? Yes. Is that the same thing? Uh, no, that's interesting. Uh, if you want, it depends on what word you want to make as the more sacred word, the bigger word, the essence. The, the post-Android meme society does communicate, if you use that as the key base word. But the information aspect of communication is null and void. Now, I mean, communication seems like the, the more dominant or the, the more... I would, I, would, I would assign more importance to communication than information. Information seems like the content. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, communication yeah, okay. is the, the base term, the right, more right. general ground. Uh, the ground, right? Yeah. yeah, and information is the content. So uh, the communication itself has been threatened in the, in the post-Android meme. We're still communicating, but we're communicating whether we can actually have an economy or not anymore. 
That's what we're, we're still worried. You know, we're, we're on the fringe of total wipeout of any communication. But information itself is no longer involved. It's whether, like, look at Copenhagen, the, or even the health reform bill. They cannot determine what they can communicate to the public. They can't even get their communicational statement, you know. And it, yeah. what will happen, they'll come up with something. But as somebody said, I read it today, this will never be solved. We're going to keep fighting, infighting, and it'll never end, like Finnegan yeah. Lake. There's no finish yeah. line. And, the, and uh, another idea I got from another source was that the second coming is a time of perpetual change. And perpetual change, McLuhan would say, drives people nuts. And so that nuttiness can come out in different ways. One of them is total apathy, you know, total boredom and whatever kind of state of mind. So, and whatever it is, you can communicate or do whatever you want to me. I, I'm not capable of responding. So, yes, uh, Croker's book, Data Trash, which comes out the year after spasm, goes into the problem of the death of communication. That, that event horizon, information was as, as a communicating uh, sticker, uh, ticky, sticky tape that stuck to a mind, that stopped probably in the uh, 60s. Okay. And, and that's why McLuhan used Finning his wake be, to, as a sign, a representation of where we we're at, because you can't find out where the end, the finish line or the definite position is in Finning his wake. And that's where McLuhan saw, and he was ahead of everybody in seeing that, where society had come to. And that's why he said the only communication going on is static communication, just people waving at each other. What happened by the 90s is people waved aggressively or violently or satirically. There was what we call manipian static communication, what I call manipian static communication. It's the cynical sign, that sentence I read you, the cynical sign. It, right, okay. the, the ground is there's no potential of connecting, so I will just uh, fake connecting with you. So what was the point uh, Croker was making when he uh, paired cynical? It was an interesting thing, but I, I couldn't catch it where he said something of leading cynical leading into, um, like, drum machines and the sampler or something. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Let me just see. Um, it was and, and he was sort of saying something like our, you know, our, our way of, exp our, our, we put our bodies now into these machines or something like that. I thought he said, I, I couldn't catch it, but it sounded pretty <laughs> it was, it smackingly can, intriguing. <laughs> right, let me just see... Uh, I think it was in the um, second quote you read. Maybe, oh, yeah, yeah. The first the, one. It was going back to one of the first... It might have been the first one, ne but it was near the end, I believe, of the passage. Of the first part. Of the first or the second... How many did you read by him? Two or three? Uh, three, but two main big chunks. So let's just try this uh, part here. He says, And how does music serve as a laboratory of sacrificial power to become famous or to get... Uh, to be a main figure in the informational Android meme is to be sacrificed in the long run, to the point that the Madonnas and the, the Dillons realize, well, it's okay if you collapse, because that will even give you more hype when you come back. You know what I mean? Uh, no, say that again, sorry. The Madonnas and the Dillons realize that abuse value taken over, and it didn't matter if you collapsed, that actually would give you more clout for coming back. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So they yeah. understood that fame was sacrificial. Right, right, okay. So uh, he's saying, Coker says, how does music serve as a laboratory of sacrificial power? In three ways. First, by its cultural code, where music serves to energize the dead and inert social field. That's no communication, right? Energize the dead and inert social field. Social field is okay. the medium of communication. Replacing the history of the social body, the communicating body, with the nostalgia for romantic implication of the culture of sound. So he's saying that people, kids go around with those little white things in their ears, their uh, iPods, yeah. trying to recall when there was sound. <laughs> that's, why they, that's why people obsessively have their earplugs on. They're trying to recall what it was like to have a meaningful sound. It's obsessive. But it's, while they're typing and, and tweeting about what they're doing, right? it's background. It's background for it's nostalgia for when there was a chemical body that had ears. That's what he's saying. A romantic implication of the culture of sound. Not the culture of music, just sound, just the ear itself. Sound, yeah, okay. Second, uh, it serves as a laboratory of sacrificial power by its method, where when the energy is turned on, music as a, for as a force field, 
that's like a communication field, activates the social in ruins, and then when the energy switch is flipped off, the imminent catastrophe promised by postmodern culture, that's abuse value, finally occurs as the sound fades away into the disintegration of time. More chemical body factors, time, gone. And finally, by its presence as a cynical sign, where the representational phase of music exists only as a nostalgic sign of that which long ago ceased to be. And what ceased to be? The age of power with a real referent of capital under the sign of abuse value. And where if the real tactile bodies, now here's where it comes into your point, and where if the real tactile bodies of musicians disappear into the simulational order of drum machines and samplers, it is because we are living now in the era of abuse value, another term for sacrificial power, where music is interesting only when it is purely cynical. Yeah, that, that point, that, that eludes me. <laughs> I I'm, I'm find that confusing. An empty sign of that which never was. Since, you see, why did, uh, if, if, if Melcher was picking up on something, the communicational values of the counterculture and rock music in the late 60s was meaningful for the chemical bodies. But something bigger was coming, and music no longer had a reference to a, a revolution or a counterculture. It just became a business. You know, that's the right. simple way Meltzer uh, cynically describes the change. Yeah, yeah. And what he means is that it does not have any relation to an actual chemical body, social revolution or social importance or even a social ludditeism going back to a innocent, more innocent time whatever the radicals thought they were fighting for. So, the sign of music referring to something that communicated and represented social values is gone. And that's why Croker and I say it's the android meme. Music becomes a process as an experience so that television has something to write about and talk about. And magazines have something to write about. Why does rock continue? Because it gives the other, me other media... Uh, a barrier of, well, that's excessive behavior, and we're Christians, and we're neocons, and this is standard, and Reagan is going to bring back the small-town values. It's a purely representational situation in the 70s. It's just what they call a cultural sign. And by the 80s, nobody even cares about those issues anymore because the chemical body is gone, and the TV body is being obsolesced by the chip landscape. So at that point, rock is a cynical sign. It's a reminder of when there was music. Ah, okay. And you can look at just the roll-in of bands, and I mean millions of bands over the last 30 years that, that yeah. come up and then die, come up and die, you know. Uh, um, it's because there's no human scale in it. It's there to process the global hologram, to be the, the blood, to be the coherency. It's really the computers using sound to communicate among themselves, not for the chemical body. But we, so have, the, the, but we are chip bodies. We are chip bodies, and so therefore it's communication for us on the chip body level. So what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, well, th but, this, but this is unbeknownst to the participants, of course. Uh, the participants never know what's going on. That's, that's right. History. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. It's only the rare lucky but person. But even at a... I don't know, like a very sub level or something. I mean, like people don't people get into bands and they you know write songs and they put their music on the internet. They don't. They certainly wouldn't think they're doing it because they're trying to retrieve a time when music existed. No. <laughs> they don't know their Android processors and that they want to provide content for the TV landscape that they, everybody participates in creating. And now the chip landscape, everybody participates in types away and tweets away to nobody, but they have to, that's the main general statement by McLuhan, electric media, our demand participation, everybody gets involved, and you help the whole machine going, uh, keep it going, that's why you can't blame the economy on, on the trial of the commission or the skull and bones of the CIA or the Jews or, or Russians, KGB, or me. It's because it is a process everybody types within, and there's no chemical body ways to measure it. It's Android. It's the world of Android processors, as Kroger calls it. It's recombination, recommodification, replays of what people did for the first half of the 20th century for the Android memes image of it. So it's a largely cynical process. 
It's cynical as far as the chemical body is concerned. Nobody believes in what they're doing in terms of that it'll arrive. Uh, watch, look at the collapse of, of broken social scene. Look, right. they're, they're very bad, broken social scene. Describe where they're at. And it's so interesting that Dave Neufeld came out of Dobbstown, came out of Club 22 intellectually, and was a producer of something that was broken social scene. Uh, the Andrew Amin was broken when that happened in 2002, and they just mimed it. But they had the right guy to really add the extra oomph to it, Dave Neufeld. And then what is, what is the first image of Dave Neufeld when he becomes well-known, uh, you know, in, uh, because of the, being the producer of uh, Broken Soul Scene, You Forgot It in People, and then he's working on the next album, but then someone else takes over from that. What is the image that Neufeld is first seen by anybody? He's beat up in New York City. Right, right. The first popular image of widespread newsworthy image of Newfeld is his bruised face. Face, and and David and I joked about it. He actually mimed what the message was on Bob's media ecology. He acted out right in front of everybody. Okay, I'm now famous, and I'm telling you that this is abuse. I'm a sacrificial lamb here. <laughs> you follow that? You follow yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, that's amazing. Yeah. That the one guy, the one musician, composer connected to Club 22, got known with the message of Bob and the message of Croker. I mean, John Lennon never got famous, uh, you know, when he first uh, was big in 63, 64. He didn't have a punched out face. That happened later, psychically, when he does his screaming uh, Arthur right. Janoff primal therapy, right? Yeah, yeah. Now he's picking up the abuse value of the situation. So there's, right. not, there's not many stars. And, and Neufeld is a star in a niche culture. I mean, Canada needs to create a, um, an image of a country and a culture in pop music. So they did that historical review of five phases of pop culture in Canada. And they go through, uh, I think they begin with Neil Young, and then they go into Joni Mitchell and Daniel Lanois and someone else. Right. And the fifth phase... And they make history, the CBC virtual Android meme history of Canadian culture provided by the CBC. That would be the TV landscape. They announced that the fifth change, radical and improved you know, evolution in Canadian pop culture is broken social scene. Right. Well, that was created by Neufeld. It's Neufeld's sensibility that adds the extra ice cream candy to that, to that band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're musicians. They can write stuff. But if they didn't have Neufeld, they wouldn't have had the power of that album. In 2002. And so Neufeld is right in there in the history. And what's interesting is that that very documentary gets it all wrong about Neufeld. They had yeah, him yeah. making the first album, and it's not even, he's not even mentioned in the real album he did. Yeah, exactly, yeah. He, Dave Neufeld, it's almost like he's got a curse. He's too connected to Dobbstown, too understanding, uh, he understands my stuff too well, that he ends up miming it <laughs> right there when he's, when he's brought into a to the Android meme. Hmm. So what's 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 the lesson in that then? I mean that's that's a, that's a Well the lesson for Dave yeah. was that he had someone who understood what was going on and, and laughed through with it. Laughed it through with him. That was me. But but it's almost like it is con consciousness is dangerous. <laughs> that oh yes, the Android meme knows it. Android that's why the Android meme's always making fun of me. Or, or referring to me in uh, movies, I don't know if you know about that, it's called xenarchony. Not synchronicity, it's my particular kind of synchronicity, and it's strange android meme reflecting of me. And yeah, so it's like, it's like uh, movies coming out about a, a, a strange presence named Bob or something like yeah. that. Yeah, well, SpongeBob. Um, right. It, we, need, we don't need to go into all the details. You can hear that no. on, on my own timeline, me talking about it through for the last 25 years. But the most recent one is Walter... The main character in this in the uh, pretty good series called Fringe, and he looks exactly like me, and he's acting out stuff that I'm doing with uh, my associates immediately. I don't know how. Why does our language get into a show? The show was made a couple of months before, and then but we don't get to see the show until the week we've already discussed the, the content of the show a day before. Now, why is that happening? Uh, that's a strange phenomenon. I, I think that's yeah. that's the way. That's what the critic has to be sensitive to, and, and nobody's experiencing it, so they're not sensitive to it. I'm experiencing it, so I'm sensitive to it. So I'm the greatest rock critic. 
or the greatest uh, hologram critic. But I stand on the shoulders of people who, who, who did great work before me. You know what I mean? Okay, so I, I want to go back, though, to a, a, a point raised at the top. So, that, oh. so but by me going into myself was just to explain why Newfelt, you know, guilt by association for Newfelt. Yeah, no, I, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting point actually, and that the the thing about the the photo and stuff, I yeah, I was well aware of that, but I I've never thought of it in those terms. So, um, but okay, so what do you what are you saying then when you're telling? Like, are you just screwing around when you're t- when you're nodding your head with Ben and saying rock is anti thinking? Well, when I say rock Cause is anti, because because when you listen to rock music, you're thinking. When I listen to rock music, I'm thinking. When yep. Ben listens to rock music, he thinks like I, I don't understand. I mean, yeah, what is thinking? thinking? That's where see where I go. Rock, ben doesn't know what I mean. When I go rock is anti thinking, I'm thinking of the four body model. All right, he doesn't. He's not thinking right. that. He's talking about literary uh, value judgments for the chemical body. It, it's totally uh, limited right. what he's doing. But I'm interested in keep talking to Ben so that he can dimly begin to see that I'm on a more complex level than he is. So that's why I, it frustrates him. I agree with everything he says, but I say, Ben, we haven't even started talking about what we're dealing with. <laughs> okay. Because he keeps it on the uh, on a very uh, level of his values. Okay. So, but okay, but then, so I mean, I think I see what you're saying. So when I say wrong, go, is, go okay. into it. Yeah, no, yeah. thinking in relation to the five bodies, or if that's what you mean. When you ever, you've seen that commercial of the guy listening to a stereo. It was a few years ago, and the wind is blowing his long hair back as he slumped right, out of a chair, right. okay? Yeah, it's uh, a classic image, yeah. yeah. It's a what? It, it's a classic image. Yeah, yeah, classic image. And that is exactly what's going on. Where is the thinking going on there? There's not left hemisphere thinking. There's not right hemisphere thinking. There is just reflex imagery that you get when you're on a drug. When you think of all the imagery you're registering, is thinking just registering an image? So, oh, there it is. Then you watch the next image, and then you go to the next image, and then you might wonder if they connect. Thinking is at the crudest level, processing and noticing that you're experiencing. It's an instinctive. Uh, it's the it's the mental mind image, imagery commenting on what you felt or what you experienced in your other modalities. But so, isn't thinking also? I mean, you might you might be you might be while you're listening to something, drawing connections. Oh yeah, to other but things that that's that's reacting. It's what McClellan says in his letter uh, about Burroughs. He complains Burroughs is not acting; he's, he's just reacting. reacting. So it's silly to say that rock is uh, anti-thinking. No. It's the chemical brain stimulation. That's happening, and that's why people do listen to rock or music. They're looking for imagery of the chemical body thought process. They're looking for images. So thinking is happening. So, But when I say rock is anti-thinking, it's anti-the literate Gutenberg concept of, of thinking. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And that's yeah, what... That clicked. That clicked, okay. Okay, good, yeah, because the, all you got from Elvis on was the book professor saying, this is not culture, nobody's thinking. Yeah, they're not sitting around discussing uh, concepts like you do in a seminar, but their brains are being stimulated, and they can hardly remember how to sit in a seminar after a few but, decades of that. But Okay, but here, I mean, often when I'm listening to you and Ben, and you know, this is more applicable to Ben probably, but... I'm thinking. None you know, of it's applicable to me because you haven't heard me yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only. I'm only talking. My, if I, what would Ben think if I read this Croker tomb? You know, I, I haven't done that. Well, he 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 he'd go in a rage about the the postmodern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be too much of the postmodern signs. Well, and and that leads kind of into my point, though. I think is that okay? So you just said, you know, it's it's anti-thinking if you put it in the context. You know, if. if in the Gutenberg sort yeah, of Yeah, anti-left yeah. hemisphere thinking, and that's the whole but, thing. <laughs> but there's, like, okay, there's, there's an either-or way to look at things, or there's an and way to look at things. So do you mean ben, and? Ben you mean is, both and? Both slash yeah, and? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, Ben, to me, seems very either-or. He does and, that. He does that with the value of tactile interplay, but he doesn't know how to look at how that's been externalized. You know, he's, he actually, his values are in the gap. That's why he half understands me when I say it. His values are neither left or right, neither aesthetics or political, so he's in the gap. That's tactility. 
but he, he, he uses that gap to fall back into a dialectical argument. Okay, but if you say that it's anti-thinking in the, in the Gutenbergian sense, yeah, yeah. Whatever, isn't, but can't it be that as well as all the other you know, senses? Well, you know how you get, yeah. well, there's the role of rock criticism. Rock criticism is putting the, the actual effect and the thinking process you get from rock back into left hemisphere thinking because you right. put it into a writing medium. But, it, but, but that's not ridiculous, I don't think. No, I no, mean, it's a natural Western response. It's, if, if I was a global you know, cosmic anthropologist to say, well, look, all this rock criticism is the I people of the West, their, their genetic meme basic structure of the, of the Gutenberg effect, they must translate the tactile bone conduction of rock back into, as McLuhan said, mountains of visual space, mountains of writing. Right, but but you and Ben, and I think it's later on in that quote. I, I played you that quote, but I think it comes a little later than that. You got, and I know, I, like you're you're communicating or trying to communicate with Ben in a different way, but you're you're saying Ben's that a patient of mine. Ben's a patient. Okay. He, admits it. he admits it. He says, "I okay." When he, when he catches some of the shows, he says, "You know, accidentally on Saturday night." He says, "Bob, it sounds like I'm in therapy." Okay. <laughs> I said, "You are." Okay, go okay. on. Okay, but he but um, what was the point about? Oh, so you you guys were kind of saying, so it's ridiculous for someone like Frith to think that he can put this stuff back into, like that he can bridge a gap between, you know, what the music is doing and then putting it into a literary or an academic context or something. But I, I don't see what's ridiculous. I mean, that's also what, you know, obviously what Meltzer did. It's it's in a way it's what Zappa did. I mean. Yeah, Zappa, everyone's Zappa tran was... translating it back into you know a, their own language to a, you know using their own educated minds to communicate something with it. In some ways, Zappa was a throwback to the Gutenberg great artist individualist syndrome. You know, uh, he was old fashioned that way. It's very interesting that he passed on when the uh, the Android Prosser reality of music that Croker describes in the same year, Spasm is taking over. It's like Frank's obsolete. I saw as a great symbol of uh, Frank going in 93 within my own sense of uh, dates and my own chart of what has happened over the last 50 years. But the, look, the writing, rock criticism, it's natural. You could have, the Tetrad managers, which I was part of, in the CIA in 1958 could have said, well, we have this electrified music called rock and roll. You watch, within 10 years, these young kids are going to start writing about it and, and thinking they're conceptualizing about it because the Western, the Western child must put it back into book form, must put it back into, must translate it back in. And that's why rock criticism is so important. But on my huge perspective, it's only a subset of Western effect. I look at the Chinese effect or the uh, third world effect, not just rock critics or the western right, right. kid you know what i mean so yeah. and it's very interesting how japan replays all that and uh, they replay their fanaticism of dylan that a.j weberman had you know the, right, you know these right. japanese kids that came over in the 80s and 90s are total fanatics of uh yeah. of, of the 60s 70s 80s whatever they replay as they got industrialized they needed to become western air sats western and become rock critics within the uh, replaying what Meltzer had gone through. Okay. Well, so, it, okay. So, so you see that the writing is important for Westerners. I mean, I'm a Westerner. I read rock criticism. You know, not so much now, but I did. And right. it was a. It was talking about my present. It was translating into. It was a way of thinking about rock in the left hemisphere. So it, that's why all this whole series with you is my response to Ben. See, Ben will have to eventually listen to this to find out what the heck I was saying, what I meant. I mean, we're talking McLuhan and Marx, but that's old hat uh, compared to what I could talk about. I don't get an opportunity to talk about it. I didn't get an opportunity until this sh section, number six, to bring you up to date to how I think about this. Yeah, we yeah. Had to, we had to go through five broadcasts to get to the Croker point. Right, right. And, and you can see this is a, a broad way, but I think that, that his book is what a lot, see, Westerners and literate people look for the bird's eye view, the big picture, because they come from a medium that gives them perspective, visual perspective, the view from the mountaintop. That's all what philosophy and sociology, all these 
great writers were offering. Einstein offers that. St- yeah. Stephen Hawking offers that. A brief history of time. You know, it's the it's the Mountain View. And McLuhan wrote about this in the six, in the fifties in Explorations, that journal. He said the Westerner is limited because he thinks he needs and relies on a bird's eye view. Now, once you understand that, you're not destroying. You say, you know, you, I'll deny my bird's eye view. I will never be a big thinker again with a big picture because being a Western literate person is obsolete. No, you recognize that's one part of yourself. Right, right. That's part of your quadrophenia, and you engage in the big picture. And Croker offers the big picture, and then I offer a bigger, bigger, big picture. That's why the tiny note chart is in visual form. It is raw criticism. It is put for the eye to get the big picture while telling you all the, all the, the limitations of previous styles of bird's eye view. And that was my original criticism, and I think in the first segment we did, in the first, uh, whatever we want to call it, broadcast, episode, yeah. I said that Banks and Marcus and Frith and these people do not offer a comprehensive big picture view. They remain in the dilemma of whether am I listening to something that has any meaning or do I just write about what I like? Do I write about Michael Jackson? You know, all these different quandaries goes on. And that's what you've been tracking. I'm giving you a way to get past that. And one could write this way, if you were, if Jen went or let you, in your rock criticism. Okay. <laughs> it probably would be appearing comprehensible. Well, that's too big. I just use rock to get along, I, you know, the consumer. I just want rock to get along, a rap or whatever they're into, uh, right. to, to feel my day. And no writing is going to stop that reason for rock. Rock is the most important, oh well, no, electrified music is the most important phenomenon in the Western society. And maybe the globe now. Okay. Because it holds people together. It is the real economy. So you come back to what Croker wrote, and this is very important. Never been said by anybody as far as I know. Crash music, that's what these kids are living. That kid we saw on that little YouTube, she's a crash music uh, participant. Right. And, and it's not just limited music. She had a bit of music, but then she had commentary, and, and she talked about her own audience. Now look at that. She says, ah, when I first put these out... All of you flooded me with emails, and I couldn't handle it all, so I withdrew. I adopted Bob's media calls. I went on a media fast, and I withdrew. But now I'm back, and the first five people, she's really in control now, the first five people respond to this YouTube, I will get back to you. I will provide human-scale response to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then she goes, poop, and then she starts saying, it and she cancels what she just said by going into another mood. Yeah. So she's qu- crash quadrophenia. Crash music exists as a culture smasher, a cultural cyclotron in the era of crash economy. That, that is even more meaningful today, which is to say that culture is not a reflex of political economy, but that society is now a reflex of key shifts in music theory and practice. Music rules in the quantum age because sound moves faster than the speed of light, thus quickly eclipsing history, history being visual and perspective, the big picture. Study music theory, then, as a laboratory of big transformations in power and economy. They will all have their punk period, all these phases. All, China will go through these five phases. But, but isn't music also punier as well? Or is that oh, yeah. It, it's, okay, they will all have that was Melcher's. That was Melcher's point in the early 70s in his second book, that music is no longer the the central thing anymore. Yeah, and, and it's the end of the analog media. The digital really hasn't taken over till the 80s. So he says it doesn't matter what I respond, what I like. It, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to enjoy wrestling and all the exactly, eccentric yeah. fringe stuff that he went into. All right? Yeah. It's whatever. Do your own thing. Do your own consumption. But then that changed when the Android meme replayed that and did it right back to everybody. It started doing that back to, to you. It said, what do you mean? It the Android means said, well, we're going we're gonna to put an actor in as president, and you know it's a fake, but we don't care if you think it's a fake, and we're going to be Melter. We're going to present the most cynical bunch of information right back at you. And it peaks with Jerry Springer. Or we're going to have a war, and we're not even going to explain why we're doing it. Okay? Right, okay. So, that, so all, the, all societies, what, what Croker says, all societies get cloned. The Western archetypes get cloned. So all clonings of this Western dynamic we've talked about will be, he says, they will all have their punk period, their sampler phase, their house music. Now, punk period, late 70s. Sampler phase, I remember that C. Kelly, mid-80s. 
house music era. I remember Gerald Belange playing me house music in 1991. Yeah. Their heavy metal economy. Now, heavy metal is before, is sort of before punk and after punk. It's always there, isn't it? It's always there, yeah. It's, well, at this point, it's, and for some years now, it's been just its own sort of like huge subculture. Yeah, and so can we say that heavy metal came back in the 90s after the house music era for a little while? Um, well, it's interesting. Yeah, that would be metal, Guns N' Roses. Well, that, and that's, yeah, I mean, close enough. It's late, like late 80s, you know, there was all these, you know, kind of hair metal bands. Yeah. And Guns N' Roses were kind of the, the, the climax of that, and they're also, like, a lot more tougher and dangerous than, than those bands. And it, it was huge at that time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's 88, 89. Right. And then you get into the final phase and this is undeniable, their rap aesthetics for the commodified body. Rap and hip-hop takes over. Yeah, yeah. So those five phases are all within the Android meme. Punk, punk, Android meme, for me, really gets going in the late 70s and goes till uh, 2000. And so the first Android meme replay of electrified music is the punks. So you begin with the punk and then the sampler and the house music and the heavy metal and then rap. So those are the phases... And what is, uh, sound is, see, when um, uh, Meltzer is saying music is puny, he means it does not refer to the chemical body anymore. It does not have the chemical body values. The counterculture thought was being expressed by the Doors or the Mothers or the Beatles in the 60s. Right. And they didn't know that we're living 200 years every 12 months. And that phase, it was a glorious phase, you know, lasts for a couple of years in the late 60s. And then it moves on to another whole sensibility. Right. Okay. Because, because the, the electrified body takes over. I remember Baby Boomer saying to me in 70, 71, uh, that some of them were becoming teachers at university. And they said, this next generation... They're not interested in anything we're interested in. They're just bland kids who just want to get a job at the university. You and Newfeld maybe were part of that. Well, you might come a little later. But, later, the, uh, yeah. but the, 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 the baby boomer professors who believed in education and thought they would, well, we'll pass off the revolution. We got beat up by Nixon, but we'll pass it on to the next generation. The next generation was, was indifferent because they didn't know that they were not talking to a chemical body generation there. These kids were now beginning to adopt the TV landscape as a part of themselves. And so education was just another TV show, but one you had to take so that you can keep, get a job, so you can keep watching TV or consuming uh, FM music. Right, right. Or, or Quadrophenic or, the, you know, high, high developments in stereo in the 70s. You see, it, it, Meltzer did not have the big picture view. You know, he, and, well, geez, I don't know who has it. I mean, I had it, but it's, I was lucky. But it's pretty hard to have it. But I'm putting tough standards on this discipline. You know what I mean? I'm right, saying right. we have not been doing our homework. And, and you can put me on any panel of rock critics, and I could be up to speed on what they're saying, and I might add another level, and most of them would say, well, that's irrelevant. But I say it is relevant, because all the problems they talk about as rock critics, and this comes up occasionally, falls into failing to see what Croker has established. So, just out of curiosity in regards to Croker, does he, um, does, does he actually cite specific sort of, like, will he point to specific examples of, of stuff happening, say, in music, like, yeah. actually delve a bit into genres or bands or anything as to just to just sort of prove his points, or well, uh, is that not, I mean, I, I know that's not. I don't. I'm not necessarily. He has to do that to make. No, it he does. But here's the thing: he does a lot on Madonna, a lot on um, on Michael Jackson back then in the '90s, and right. I've heard you talk about that before with um, on Cashflow, James, Martin, James Martinez. Yeah, that, that, I, and I'm very interested in reading what he says on Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah, because the death of the Android meme as mixed media was symbolized by uh, Michael Jackson's death. And the re we can go. That's all the topic. We could go into detail another time yeah, on that. Yeah. But the, okay. but the, um, uh, our our friend Earmap, he he told me that uh, Croker. He, he told me this years ago. Croker actually didn't have a fine ear or nose for the subtleties in pop music. He kind of just knew the general stuff like Elvis, uh, 
That's uh, but, what I'm getting at with my question. Okay. Yeah, it's like, you know, that line I always use, the Eskimo sees 50 kinds of snow. Croker, probably because he's such a literate, high literate person, reads a lot in, in his field. I don't know what music he's listening to. I do know uh, that he used to go with his uh, wife to uh, oldies dances, like the 50s or something, you know, okay. uh, back in the 80s. But anyways... Uh, Irma pointed out that he's not too good on the 50 kinds of snow. I mean, we don't know what he would think of Zappa or even know about Zappa. He might have heard him, but he doesn't think it's worth writing about. He writes about the most general Android meme, the centralized parts of Android meme, like Michael Jackson, Madonna. And so he's not good at the 50 kinds of snow, but he is uh, very good at writing the general picture. And right. if you want him to write about broken soul scene, he's not going to get it. But if you right, want, right. but you have to understand as a rock critic what the Michael Jackson scenario is, and uh, he Croker is good on, useful on that. Okay. The part of you, the one fourth of you, that is subject to the centralized Android meme. I mean, most of your life is not with that. I mean, I haven't a chance to read your column, but as I uh, looked at how you added to our part. I would see you listing the best of the uh, of this decade, right? That's right, your, that's right, your yeah. writing. The rock, uh, all the I never heard of any of it, and I said I'd like to listen to read that sometime. I don't know when I'll get the time, but it's an example of you knowing fifty kinds of snow from the last eight years. You know, right, right. I don't know who the hell you're talking about, and you're actually having value judgments and, and critiquing one over another, I guess, right. and, <laughs> and, and very particular about your consumption habits. You have to see that. Someone 150 years ago would look at a young person like yourself. You're like a woman trying to figure out what shoe to wear. And I'm not right. putting it down. I'm saying that the discarnate uh, television landscape body, chip body consumer, is not is asexual. He, men do what women do in consuming all this information overload. But what would be, you know, women worried about what they wore 150 years ago or even 100 years ago, whereas men just wore the same crappy sh- to their job, you know, and they weren't aestheticized so much. Right. Only the right. only the dandies like uh, Oscar Wilde hooked uh, right. that up. Yeah. But if if someone from that period saw what you were writing, they say, "What the heck is wrong with Scott?" <laughs> I mean, the guy is worrying about what dress he's going to wear today, or what was the best dress he wore two years ago. You see what I'm saying? That that we're all Android processors now, with no sexual reference point like that. What, the old guy who would, who would think you were silly he doesn't understand the present. He doesn't even see that we must process like, ah, we all go right hemisphere. That's feminine. Right. We're all feminine now. As, as, as McLuhan said, uh, art was taken over by pop, by males, uh, because it had traditionally been a female situation. But the men took it over because it was the way to organize power around music, fashion, and, and advertisement, and glitter. That was the real control. So when people worry about the trial of the commission on David Rockefeller, it's silly. The, the, the control Worry point, about what, sorry? Worry about what? Uh, trial of the commission or David Rockefeller or the Rothschild oh, okay. and the yeah, conspiracy okay. of the Illuminati. The Illuminati is right in your face 24-7. Right now, I just thought in Drudge, the, uh, a, a major part of the centralized form of the Android meme uh, has a new face. It's Diane Sawyer. She's taken over from, I think she's ABC News, from Charles Gibson. That they have a picture of her, you know, all prim and proper. She's going to have to maintain the local centric reality of points of view and what time it is. All, it, all obsolesce because the real action is happening in Oprah. And then the real action after that is Howard Stern. And then the real action for most kids is themselves and that little kid just processing her own stuff. Notice this, the, the song she used. What was it? George Michael? Well, what's that? I recognized it. was a, that opening song. I, did, I didn't hear it, but was it Freedom 90 or something maybe? Or I, I, did, I didn't hear it. So uh, It was an 80s or 90s song. But it, it was like you're way before. Probably, probably Freedom 90 is this real upbeat sort of thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't even know okay, it. I just sure. recognized it from a long time ago. I know that it's it's probably uh, was a hit well before she was born. Oh, okay. Okay. For and George it, Michael? Or no, because he no, because he. I mean, he had hits in the '80s, so. That's what I mean. It was something. I but don't not know. before she was born. She's not that young, I don't think. But anyway, that no. Is okay, she's she's 16 or 17. Okay. Diane Sawyer. Who? Are you talking about Diane Sawyer? No, 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 no. I, I switched to that little girl. The quadri- <laughs> the qua- the qua- oh, okay, okay. It's the quadraphenic girl, 
okay? That opening song, now you know what I'm talking about, maybe you know it. It was a well-known song uh, 15, 20 years ago. She, she loves that song. Yeah, I think it is Freedom 90. I'd have to watch it again. Okay. Right. <laughs> I was messed up there. I thought you were talking about dance. It, I don't know. I don't know George Michael's stuff, but that's what comes to mind. It's amazing what Pretty we know. Pretty sure Freedom 90. It was, a, it was a big single, yeah. yeah. It's a nice song. I like it. Or a little bit I heard in her thing, but I remember it. I mean, it's candy. I like it for a second, but it's, it's gone. You know, I forgot I listened to it. Then I'm liking something else. That's why it's very hard to have value judgments in this Android music processing situation. But the uh, but if you're going to write something, you got to have a big picture, so you got to take a, a star as your icon, and then you revolve everything around that. On that level, I've used Zappa, right? He's my he's my uh, mountaintop, right? That I yeah, compare yeah. music, but I don't I don't live within that. I know that the, even he knows that it's silly to be comparing within that, unless you are a professionally a rock critic. That's your job: produce values of the eye. Values well, it's interesting. Of- well, but Bob, let me finish this point about this okay, girl. Go. So this okay. girl, she's quoting a song that never happened in her time, but we live in the heliotropical no time, to quote page 349 of Phoenix Way, where any kid can like anything from any era, and it can, and it can communicate to him. So it's not even representation of her generation. It's just something mm-hmm. she likes, but she has a whole archive of music to pick from, a whole 20th century. So you right. can't, she can't, and more and more as more music is created, over the last 30 years, the kids can't take it in and identify it with a generation. They just experience it because they got more and more technology to experience any time replay for them, and so it's not related to social community of a decade. Okay, though, if I wanted to, to, to be even more specific about that, though, from a technological, uh, instrumental sort of standpoint, I mean, I, I agree with that totally, but I, I think it's particularly true in regards to certain musical technologies that came into being like like I, I i don't think there have been you know there has been a lot of specific um formal changes in music since about 1983 or 84 well that's what croaker meant tech, that's what croaker technology with the drum machines and synthesizers sort of became you know one of the norms and sampling and all that and yeah, I, I mean, so it's interesting that you're mentioning George Michael because he does come after that era. But I think even Dave Newfeld would agree with me that if you know, well, maybe not, but they, the, there might be a bridge to gap if you went back. If you went, if you played that girl, the Beatles, it might seem like a different. Like I don't know if I would, if, if the all times and all you know. No oh yeah, in other words, you're saying totally, totally flies when you get past a certain or, or before. Prior to a certain time. Before 77. You do not get back before the Android meme. Those five phases I listed from Croker are the five phases of Android meme, and that's what these kids live with it. Yes, you're right. They only live, and it's only re commodified, replayed, holopathic replays, but that's just for music. They, that's not even an issue. That's just to keep their ear a sense right, of that right. as an ear. What they're really doing is going beyond music and expressing themselves in multimedia. Right, right. You know, so it's beyond music. Yeah. So, so yes, but you're right. If you're going to have music, you better have made it into the uh, Android meme. Right, okay. And now there, it's in, you get kids, uh, they accidentally discover uh, Dylan or the Beatles because their parents or yeah, grandparents, yeah. you know, and Some then they might music. like it. Their personality goes and they like it. But in general, sure. in general, you're right. They, there's if you don't, you're not part of the last 25 years. You, you got, you know, you don't exist. Yeah, the ki- the kids now who who get, like Dylan and the Beatles are the kids in 1967 who liked Frank Zappa and the Velvet Underground. Yeah, they, they, there's always now. That's what my chart offers. Is you can look at. A personality type will be attracted to a certain meme. One personality type will be attracted to LaRouche, another to McLuhan, another to Thompson, another to Croker, and another to me. You know, there's you can show the the mental type, the thinking apparatus. I mean, the uh, the tree hugger goes for uh, uh, the William Irwin Thompson quadrant. And what music do I have in there? I got Lou Reed, Lou Reed, and. Uh, Maybe someone else. Um, in the Croker quadrant, I've got Johnny Rotten and Disco. In the Dobbs quadrant, I've got Madonna and something else. Uh, I can't remember. Just quadrophenia. Okay. Quadrophenia or something. But the um, 
And the LaRouche has uh, Patsy Klein and uh, and Jazz. I, I, we'll go into that chart in a future okay chat because I do. I, I want. I definitely want to go there's, into that. I have, I have a hard time figuring out just even when you're telling me now, like how how it like, fits. Pat, Patsy Klein, Lyndon LaRouche, just sounds bizarre. <laughs> 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 well, well, it's back with her. You know, LaRouche, here's a, an example. LaRouche is a sentimentalist for the industrial age. Right, right. Okay? He's a sentimentalist. He's kind for, of like the Theodore Adorno almost, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, Patsy Klein is in there because she has such sentimental music for the time when the chemical body had a social space, which is what country music appealed to back then. The slow People in the slow lane back in the 60s like country music, you know. Uh, right. And so LaRouche is in the slow lane representing the retrieval, hopefully, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, that's yeah, the way yeah. you look at it. Like, though, right, right, yeah. Pretty well, everything is in that chart. I mean, that, that's my fitting its wake. I mean, I could, you know, explain so much for years on that. Well, I've done it with Scott Norris. You know, I've done a lot on... Yeah. There's yeah. a lot. It's a lodestone and a touchstone. It's an indication of a modern alchemy, it, and it, it includes all that I'm quoting from Croker as one quadrant. Okay. Like, so the personality type that likes, I don't know what you call it, they they believe in apple pie and mom or something, or they want to get married. They probably maybe grew up in a family with divorced parents, never had a family. There's a lot of kids like that now that go neocon just to see what it's like to be a family. You know what I mean? So they're very right, rigid right. in having a family life that they never had as a kid. They want they so they are they're trying to recover the LaRouche Patsy Klein world. Hmm. Doesn't work unless you know you know Bob knowledge and can see through the dynamics. But most people aren't interested in that. They can't take it. They don't want to know as much as I know. <laughs> it's too, why bother? It's a short life. I'm just going to enjoy myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bob. It's about. Uh, I think. I think it's time to wrap up. Okay, well, uh, we, we, we could we could go on with more, but uh, why don't we try and um, catch up in a week again? Okay, so it's okay I went on so much. What's that? It's okay that I quote dominate. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, and um, the Croker stuff is is you know I'm I'm looking forward to listening back and trying to um, catch more of it because yeah it, it kind of goes by in a blur, but I you know. As you're reciting it, I'm kind of just pulling some phrases out of out of what you're saying, and I, I wrote a couple sort of things down. So I mean, I, that's why I kind of thought of the drum machine sampler cynicism line. Right. Yeah. I'm interested in, you know, listening again about the whole idea of the crash music and all that sort of stuff. And I guess the music as the leading sort of. I, I guess the thing I still find contradictory. This will be my last point, and if yeah. you want to respond to it, it's fine. But the, this this thing about music being the leading. Force field, um, leading force field. Okay, I guess I'm I'm still not I'm still have difficulty with understanding how that ties in with music just being one part of the whole. Like, is it is it is it the dominant thing? I, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that. I don't. Well, have... remember, it's not music per se anymore. Right, it's I mean, not music you, per se. You know what it is? It's a guy in a car booming his. Is automobile out of people? It's mixed media. Is the new form of entertainment? It's the definition of music then that I yeah, that yeah. I have to think about. I okay. mean, yeah, Croker is uh, maybe uh, playing too much with the old definition and not, but pointing to my definition, but not uh, okay. being so clear about it. He's in between. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about Croker. Is for me. He uh, he replays McClune, but he has to complexify it because that's the way postmodern academia was. You had to be real complex. Um, McClune predicted it. You, you had to go medieval and count the number of angels on the he- on the head of a pin. They right. they over verbosize it, but but since you have to create something new, and and Croker's writing during the Andromeda meme, so he's part of the Andromeda meme. You got to complexify McClune and actually claim you're not doing McClune, which is what he did. But he was. Right. When I come along, I correct it. I said, oh, no, you're doing McClellan. I'll show it to you. And I show it to Ben all the time. Right. Okay, so uh, okay. I, will, I will send you the few quotes, the little bits I have here. Uh, That'd be great. So you can at least have those. That'd be great. 
Okay. We'll, uh, we'll try and chat next week. I don't know if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah, Bob, but uh, have a good one. <laughs> okay. No, we don't celebrate anything. We have it every day. Yeah, that's <laughs> every day here. <laughs> okay. I'll try, I'll try and follow that model. Yeah. <laughs> I, I celebrate so much, I'm not specializing in one day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have expected that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Talk to you later, Scott. Talk to you in a week, Bob. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.